So our work is publicly funded. We actually have the university at the Canberra. Um, so we receive government funding. So our work is yours. That's that's what we're here for to provide information um, to you. We give you software that we provide to the end factory. That software is open source. So um, just wanted to emphasize that please use us as a resource. Um, Thank you, Thank you. Okay, so Tim, Tim has um, painted a picture of what a community battery is. And I thought that I would really take a step back and think about what is the role of energy storage in our future energy system to start with. And after I take that step back, then zoom back in on the few region and think about what kind of things you might need to consider if you're considering um, a community battery here in your region. So as Tim said, a lot of the things that I'm covering and we cover very quickly for us too. Um, we are in a transition to a fully electrified decarbonized energy system. Um, to support that, we need energy storage at all scales. So we need um, large-scale energy storage on the transmission system that will be mostly supplied by hydro, and pumped hydro. And we need small-scale storage on the low voltage in the grid where, where we live. Um, that will be most of the batteries. So the latest research suggests that we'll need about um, 10 to 20 times more small-scale storage over the next 15 years. So why do we need this battery storage? So there, there are two main reasons, and one that you will all know already, and one that you might not know because you've only just really learned about it recently. So the one that we will know already as to be that is this storing of energy. And obviously that's great for us at the moment because we have huge amounts of solar during the day. We need to store it when we need it in the evening. And as Tim said, it's, it's um, if we don't store that solar, we're generating, generating so much solar that we sometimes have to detail it because we can't put it into the grid. It's, it's so much energy. So storing it locally is a good idea. Um, the second reason why is because um, batteries provide really important network support services that we need to provide in the grid without coal and gas power stations. So this is something that we've really just been able to demonstrate recently in Australia. And Australia is really a world leader in this area, so we should be very proud. Um, I wanted to tell you about an example project that has occurred recently, which really demonstrates this nicely. So this is the W Cool battery on the York Peninsula in South Australia. So the York Peninsula um, runs downwards has a really long single um, wire, which is 120 kilometers long to the main grid. At the end of the, that wire is around 4,500 people. Um, so the local electricity network service provider decided to install a relatively big battery just to improve the reliability of the electricity supply to those people in the York Peninsula. But this turned out to be a really important demonstration project because they showed that they could disconnect from the main grid and run the whole electricity network from the York Peninsula just from that battery. So the battery provides the voltage, the frequency, and then the inertia support that you need to run the grid. And then that's what we need in the future in Australia. We can switch off all of our coal power and our gas power. Just read yesterday that the Murray power station will close early. Um, one of our big coal power stations. So this this is the kind of demonstration project that we need to demonstrate that we can run our electricity grids just with battery power alone. Um, obviously, it's a step up from carrying a grid that's for four and a half thousand people to the whole. Um, electricity network of Australia, but the physics is the same. So it's been demonstrated and um, we're moving in that direction to be able to show that it can be done on large networks. Okay, so we need lots more 
small scale storage um, on a low voltage grid where we live. So that will be supplied by household batteries and electric vehicles. I wonder how many people have a household battery here. And how many people have an electric vehicle? And how many people want an electric vehicle? <laughs> okay. Um, to add to that mix, are we going to see neighborhood batteries uh, in this small scale storage mix? So I should just point out here that we use the term neighborhood batteries, which is a more which is a broader term in community batteries. And we say the term community batteries for those projects that are really involved with the community, like the DF1, but not all batteries of this scale and type involve communities when we use this broader term neighborhood batteries. So I think Tim has already done a really excellent job of outlining what are uh, neighborhood scale batteries. So they're bigger than household batteries and they're designed to be shared within a suburb. And usually they sit in front of really large grids and complex cities. So, what we have seen over the last couple of years is that there has been huge interest in this kind of battery storage um, from the energy industry, from regulators, and also from community groups and households as well. Uh, so, we've been doing research in this area for about three years. And some of the research that we've done has been trying to really quantify what are the potential advantages of this kind of storage over alternatives like household storage. So just to start with looking at the technical, economic and environmental impacts, technically we, we're really interested in this concept of hosting capacity and Tim referred to this before. So that, that refers to how much solar energy and EVs you can put onto a network without causing issues. So that's what we call hosting capacity. And um, our work has shown that you can increase hosting capacity with a manual scale battery over and above the increased hosting capacity from household batteries. So the other thing that we've looked into is potential economic advantages. Um, and we've shown that you need on the order of half the capacity of battery if you're sharing a battery compared to if you have your own household battery. So overall, we need half as much battery in total, so that would be cheaper. And the other thing is that you can use the battery to access more of um, this value stack, which means this, this revenue sources that team is looking at where you're getting trading in the energy market to get a bit more revenue to make your project financially feasible. And then environmentally, this is something that we're really interested in as well. Um, whether this type of battery storage could provide a greater reduction in emissions per kilowatt hour compared to, say, household batteries. Um, we're in the process of calculating that. This is what Louise is working on. Um, research from the US and from Europe suggests that it can result in uh, a greater reduction in emissions compared to household batteries. But um, I want to point out that this is this is definitely not a given with battery storage. I mean, batteries um, are inherently inefficient, and if you charge a battery from the grid, like Tim was pointing out in the evening, when the grid is mostly powered by coal, and then you discharge at a time when there's a lot of renewables, you're actually going to result in an increase in carbon emissions if you're using batteries like this. So it's something that we have to have really in the front of mind when we're designing this kind of technology, designing our software, that this is, you know, we don't want to have increased emissions, we don't want to have decreased emissions. But it has to be uh, integrated in the design of the technology. I think um, for me, it's been very surprising and interesting to see the social side of this work. So I work in engineering and I started out doing all the calculations and stuff, the technical stuff and economic stuff. Um, then we had social researchers come on board and we started speaking to people. And what we saw was this huge interest in the technology. And really what we saw is that this 
Unlike technology, it really seems to align with what people want out of the energy transition. So, in some ways, that's sort of obvious stuff, like cheap, clean, more fair. But in some ways, it's more complex. It's about collective action. It's the stuff that Kathy was talking about. It seems like this kind of project is a way for people to be engaged and be involved in the energy transition. And it seems like it's the right scale to, to be able to do that. So it's not just your household battery, which is also really, really cool. Um, grid scale, which is often a freedom, but the neighborhood scale battery is something people can really collectively engage in and be involved in. So for me, this is um, this has been totally by <laughs> to sort of see this, this aspect of the technology and think about how important the social um, side is when we think about technology development. And my colleague, Heather and Susan, will be speaking a lot more about that in the um, event tomorrow that's put on by Toby and we will be sure. So I think that will be a very interesting talk. Okay. So everything sounds very great about neighborhood batteries. Um, when the second there are lots of challenges, and uh, Tim has covered some of the ones that they've, they've uh, come up against in their work. But we, so we, we as research partners, speak to a lot of different projects around Australia. So we're hearing of all of these challenges um, with financial, uh, work, the project we're financially, um, who will own the battery, how will we be involved, how are customers involved, all of these practices. Things and then before when I talked about the value stacking, you know, what we really realize now is that it's about value balancing. So, how do you build the project in a way that you um, can make the most of the values it offers, but at, a, at the same time, sometimes those values are, um, are clashing with each other? For instance, you might have to make a choice about whether you want to make more money from changing the energy market or. Or alternatively reducing your carbon emissions. You might not be able to do both of those things at the same time. So this is a lot of the research that we're looking at is this what we're now calling value balance and not value stacking. But it's definitely a challenge when you're planning your project. So I wanted to give you an overview of where we're at in Australia. It's pretty exciting times. Um, so we had the first yeah, this map is when we just implemented projects and green is coming soon. So we had the first projects that were in WA. Um, their system is still government on it, so it's really easy to implement from there. Then last year we had three community batteries roll out in Sydney from the network operator Osprey. Um, and then all of the rest are coming soon. Soon as this yes, battery in June. Um, we have another battery in Tarnit that will come online this year, I think. Mm -hmm. Tarnit, yeah, I think it's in Geelong, it's got one of the highest solar penetration um, rates in Victoria. Um, in planning is one near us in Canberra, which is in Jacka, and this is an interesting one because a lot of our new suburbs in Canberra are planned to be all electric. So the battery is really an important part of that um, future energy system in an oil electric suburb. And um, what else do I want to mention? A network of batteries to be installed by the city of Melbourne, another one at the island. Um, a lot of these projects have received funding from the Victorian government network battery initiative, which has been a, a very wonderful thing to have. Um, and I, yeah, I guess from our perspective, so we, we are research partner on some of these projects. It's really, really great to see that all of the trials have been really set up. So we really learn about the different battery models, different ownership structures, to see what are the structures that are going to work best in terms of returning the most value to the community. So I thought it might be useful to give a little summary of the battery models that have been trialed so far or proposed so far, as well as the ownership options that have been um, suggested so far. 
So we came up with four different battery models. So the first model is this virtual storage idea, and that's what has been implemented in the batteries in Western Australia and also the new ones in Sydney. So that that works where customers um, pay a subscription fee and it's sort of like a virtual battery for them. They get a certain spice of, of the battery to use per day. Um, another model is a passive model and that has been implemented in these um, batteries I didn't mention before that run down on the Mornington Peninsula and there's it's a pretty cool idea actually. They're um, whole top mounted batteries. So you actually have them, you probably wouldn't even notice them, but they're there. Um, so that's what I call passive because the customers have nothing to do with the battery. It sits there and the network uses it for this network support, solar sponge activity, um, and customers don't need to worry about it. Another type of model is this the white ball that's in the F battery. That you outlined very nicely for us. So, that will have a special solar sponge retail tariff for customers. And then another idea that's been proposed is a peer to peer trading model um, where participants in the battery model can buy and sell the energy with the battery. Um, and that is being proposed for a project that's up in New South Wales. And, but I know that they're having some issues making this. Model work. So we we'll be to see how that pans out. So, yeah, I guess I just want to mention two um, things. One is it seems like a lot of the recently announced batteries are leaning towards this passive model where you're reducing your interaction with customers. Um, and I can sort of understand because the direct, if you're trying to build on direct participation with customers, it can be complicated and expensive. So, um, yeah, I'm not going to comment on which model I think is better or worse, but just that's something to be aware of. <laughs> so, these are the ownership models that have been proposed so far. So, one is that the network owns the battery, and that is the case for the Austrian battery in Sydney. Um, one, there's a regulatory issue with that one is that the network's not allowed to buy and sell energy. So they, they can lease out part of the battery to a retailer to do that, but they have to get an exemption from the regulator. So it's a bit of a slight complication with that one. Um, another ownership model is um, a combination between the network and the market participant. Market participants on who leads energy trading in the energy market. Uh, so that's the case of Western Power. Another one is a um, community cooperative, which is the case of the Stanover one in New South Wales. Another one is the third party investor model, which is the case of EDF, yeah, so it's a non profit organization. Um, you can also have investors come on board including community investors. Uh, it could be owned by a market participant, for example, a retailer or a aggregator. And I know, so I have retailers contacting me asking, um, looking into this as a, an option for them. Another, but that hasn't been really tried yet, not yet. Uh, another option is that the council owns it, and that has not been really tried yet either. But I think it's an interesting idea, and certainly from the social research that we've done, a lot of people are interested in that idea, and I think maybe that's a good thing for the council to do. I just wanted to mention two things before I go on. So, um, in all of the models, networks are going to have a critical role to play. So, they, they have the best view of the, um, the network and the network issues in the region, um, and they can take the um, issues of the network to the competitive market to try to get a solution. So, no matter what the model that is adopted, it has to be one where it's a very close partnership with the networks. Okay, 
this whole proceeding, I think um, it's very important to keep in mind the alternatives to an analog battery, because I think sometimes we have these new technology ideas and it's really cool and let's get one. Um, we need to like stop for a second and think about what are the alternatives. The most important one to bear in mind is demand management. So try to use all of this extra solar we have um, straight away to heat your hot water system, to heat your pool, um, or with the special gadgets that you can have in your home for demand management. The other one is behind the meter batteries. Um, operating on you may not have heard of, but um, you should be aware of them because this will become an integral part of our electricity system moving forward. It's being trialed at the moment all around Australia. It's basically a smart way of operating the electricity grid where the network operators send out messages to all of the devices on the network to tell them how to behave so that they can reduce as much as possible any network constraints. So it's a really smart way to operate our electricity system. Thank goodness it's, it's a happening thing. This is work that we should be doing um, in our program at the ANU and in partnership with a lot of the networks in Australia to do trials with this. So, um, you get the same software team who are writing the software for your battery and doing this quick start with operating all the loads. Uh, they probably send you a signal to say, Can you please turn your air conditioner on a bit earlier in the day? <laughs> um, and then the other Alternative technologies, network upgrades, new pulse and wireless upgrades. Um, in some ways, we need, oh, no one wants new pulse and wires, but it might be the cheapest and best solution, so it needs to be considered. So, for you, for the human community, um, what do you need to think about if you're considering a neighborhood battery? Um, First is having knowledge of physical constraints in your system. So that basically means if you have a situation where you have too much load, which is usually in the evening, or too much solar, some don't say too much solar, solar's always good. If you have a lot of solar, and I think you do have a lot of solar, we just heard fourth highest rate of solar in Victoria or in Australia? In Australia, in this region, fourth highest rate of solar panel installation. So those are new. Um, so you need to have a constraint to have really have a good justification for having the battery there to help with the constraint. If you don't have any constraint, then it's hard to justify. And it will also be hard to make the project work financially because you can't get payment for that service that the battery could provide. There are you know, big challenges with costs and um, who will pay for it, but just to note that capital costs are really coming down with batteries. Um, so, and will continue to come down. Projected revenue, which is important, but that's very hard because everything's changing in the electricity system and in the electricity market. Um, and like I said, the network partnership is completely fundamental. But what might be the potential benefits of a neighborhood battery for the human region? Um, it could help you support your um, very admirable 100% renewable goals. Um, increase network reliability. So typically the batteries that are rolling out at the moment, the network batteries don't have um, this ability of that South Australian one to, to Ireland, but they can have that in the future. So you can have a little microgrid that's operated from the battery. So that's something to consider. I know that's something that Lane is interested in putting the EA in terms of push fires. Um, we found some work with Lane looking at that. Um, and then considering just revenue sources, so revenue from the wholesale market and local trading arrangements and also community benefits, very importantly. Um, wanted to mention some of our research that we were working on into the future that. Maybe of use to you. So, one is the neighborhood battery guidelines, um, which is really to connect people who are interested to uh, all of the information that they need to look into neighborhood batteries. Uh, the other one is uh, we're trying to continue to find ways to quantify 
the potential benefits of neighborhood batteries technically, environmentally, socially, economically. Um, it's really important and it's our job, you know, working in the university to make sure that we provide the evidence of whether there are advantages of this type of technology and other alternatives. So our job is to find out, find the evidence. If there is evidence to show that, then we need to inform the system and policy design um, to support the rollout. So the current system, both the market and the regulatory system, really favours household batteries. But if we think that neighbourhood batteries are a good alternative, then we need to find the evidence and take that to the policy makers to inform them. Um, Okay, so is there a role for neighborhood scale batteries in the human region? I think we will have a bit more of an idea after another year or so when we see all of these trials in Australia really start to roll out. And on paper, it looks good. A lot of our research shows that there are advantages, but I think it really remains to be seen from these trial projects that are going ahead. And as I mentioned, because they're so diverse in the way it's been rolled out. I think if you keep an eye on the space, you'll get them. Um, you'll be well informed to make a decision about whether this is a good technology for you moving forward. So that's it for me. So feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And this is our website address, which has a lot of our reports. We've got webinars and so on to have a look at there. And just to mention that this um, session with me is. Um, supported by that Victorian government medical faith battery initiative program. Thank you very much.